Well, thank you, Carrie Ann. It's very nice to see you as well. And uh, oftentimes, people in government have lots of conversations about a lot of things, but it takes leadership and vision to actually bring them to fruition. So thank you for your leadership and your vision. Thanks to Stanford University for hosting us in this amazing space. Um, and uh, I was going to also uh, recognize my colleagues, our Assistant Administrator for International and Tribal Affairs, Michelle DePass, our, our Chief Financial Officer at EPA, Barb Bennett, who is here because she's also voluntarily uh, spearheaded our desire to work more with sustainable businesses and to find ways for a regulatory agency, which is what EPA is, to help businesses who are trying to go beyond regulation and look at triple bottom line and other activities. Uh, and I also have to acknowledge Jared Blumenfeld who runs EPA's office not too far away in San Francisco and does an amazing job uh, while he does. So thank you for joining me here today. As you can see, I was a little iffy because of this voice, um, but it is a pleasure to be here at this conference and it's an opportunity I can assure you I would not have missed unless I literally couldn't physically make it up those stairs. That's because the people in this room and the people we work with who are involved in this effort, who come from so many different countries, from so many different professions and perspectives, are so important to what happens next. We are all united by our desire to improve the world we live in, and not only the world that we live in, but the world that our children and our grandchildren will live in as well. That's the simple, simple idea that brings us together. The challenge ahead of us, though, is unlike anything we faced before, whether it's as individual nations or as a collective, as one planet. For the first time in human history, we are beginning to see that everyday activities, the things we buy, the way we keep the lights on, the ways we travel, have an impact on the health of our entire planet. For the first time in human history, more people are living in cities and urban areas than are living in rural areas. And over the next 30 years, most of the anticipated population growth is expected to happen in cities. And for the first time in human history, we have in our sights the possibility of fostering a truly global middle class with billions of people enjoying a quality of life and opportunity their parents and grandparents never knew. As a result of all this, the years ahead will stretch the limits of our energy, our water, and our food supplies. We will require not just new power and water sources, but also the infrastructure to deliver reliable energy and water to billions of people. We will need more affordable housing. We will need more transportation that is adequate for people and products, as well as systems to address concentrated urban waste and pollution, both in the air and in water. And last but certainly not least, it will be essential to generate economic opportunities that ensure widespread global prosperity. But also for the first time in human history, I believe we have the ability to meet all of these needs and build a sustainable future. We have the tools and the understanding and we have the necessary commitment to global cooperation and collaboration. It is a big task ahead of us. True sustainable development will demand the integration of our economic, our social, and in our environmental priorities. Our history shows us that without balance between these three things, we risk losing all three. It's easy to feel overwhelmed by the challenges, poverty, conflict, climate change, loss of critical ecosystems. But it is important that we remember that sustainable development also provides great opportunities. We have opportunities to improve the lives and health of people around the world. We also have opportunities for innovation, new technologies, and enhanced collaboration. Later this year, the world will come to Rio Plus 20 armed with a set of tools that were unheard of in 1992. This room alone, with all the cell phones, laptops, and other devices, probably holds more computing power than our early space program did. <laughs> Those changes in technology have inevitably and irrevocably altered the way that we and the organizations we represent do business, the ways we connect, the ways we educate, and so much else. Perhaps most importantly, 
The ability to use technology to reach across the globe has fundamentally changed the ways we consider each other. In the early 1990s, the first images of the Earth from space, the famous blue marble photograph, sharpened the realization that we all share a single planet. For many people, it was a motivation to help protect and preserve that single planet. Today, the ability to hear, to see, to interact in real time with people and events across the planet has illustrated just how connected we all are. And it has motivated us to see our shared interest in the quality of life for people thousands and thousands of miles away. From the perspective of the people in this room, advances in technology have connected us to a valuable resource for our work, that is our people. The internet and social networks give citizens from across the globe the ability to participate in the push towards sustainability in their own local communities. It allows them to contribute, contribute their local experiences, their personal observations, their indigenous knowledge, which can be tapped locally, but also globally for better results. People around the world have begun to use connection technologies to achieve sustainable development goals. And you will hear and have already seen examples uh, yesterday and over the next few days. But we know that these efforts have only just begun to tap the great potential that this resource holds for the issues faced by people in different settings around the world. We should and must challenge ourselves to find creative new ways to apply existing technologies and look ahead to emerging technologies and their potential impacts for the good as well as not so good. As many of you know, the EPA just turned 40 years old. Actually, we just turned 41 years old. The history of environmental protection in the last four decades has been perhaps more than anything else a history of technology innovation. Everything from cleaner power plants and more efficient and cleaner vehicles to greener, safer chemicals and new strategies for protecting our resources. Technology and innovation will continue to be key pieces of how we grow and address the world's emerging challenges. Right now, some of the highlights include the Air Now program, which gives real-time data on air quality, putting that vital information in people's hands so that they can take the necessary steps to safeguard their own health. We formed an interagency partnership on sustainable communities. The innovative idea behind that is actually common sense. We're working at the federal level to make sure our housing priorities and our transportation priorities and our environmental priorities and all the investments in those three areas work together. But that partnership is also exploring innovative technologies for designing the communities of the future. Another great example is our Apps for the Environment Challenge. The EPA has challenged our citizens to use the data. We have a treasure trove of data at EPA. To use it to provide to the public, to design interactive, useful apps that will help users protect their health and their environment. Those are just a few examples, and I hope that this conference raises even more that we can use domestically as well. Now, one of my top priorities in all of this is ensuring that our innovations serve every community. We can and we must ensure that these efforts benefit our most economically challenged and environmentally polluted communities. Without smart planning that focuses on those needs, the transition from rural to urban areas that is happening across the globe might only actually work at worsen people's circumstances. Disadvantaged communities, women, minorities, and youth are often left out of decision making and access to new technologies. Community, communications technologies have proven effective in helping these communities gain access to information and better jobs and improve quality of life. In my travels as administrator, I've been to parts of the world where it seemed like everyone had access to a cell phone, but not everyone had access to clean water. The opportunities are there to use that technology to make a difference in the technology that's lacking. This administration has made clear that investing in communities, investing in youth, and investing in women is investing in the world's future. 
Connection technologies have the potential to help bring together stakeholders from across the spectrum. This is something we're counting on in the joint initiative on urban sustainability that the United States and Brazil formed last year. Our two nations are working to promote sustainable urban development by drawing a straight line between community needs and government policies, between private sector project development and financing institutions. In other words, our joint initiative is much more than a partnership between our two governments. Brazilian and US officials are collaborating with environmental experts and city planners, connecting with US and Brazilian companies that specialize in sustainable innovation and working with financial institutions to capitalize growth that will create jobs in the US and Brazil while blazing the path for cutting edge urban sustainability. Through it all, we will be learning the best practices that can be transported to cities across the world. Through broad public and private collaboration made possible through new technology, we can show the world how to build, build upon, and build 21st century urban communities where the environment and health and social inclusion and economic prosperity go hand in hand. Now, accountability is also an important part of what technology offers us today. Good environmental governance involves everything from government to government initiatives on technical assistance and information sharing, all the way to supporting the bottom-up community initiatives that are the foundation of environmental protection, like the panel of women scientists in Ethiopia that I spoke to on a trip to Eastern Africa last year. We know that governments that involve their citizens are transparent and efficient in their operations and are truly accountable for environmental results are the most effective at meeting the challenges we share. When communities are better able to articulate and broadcast their needs to a wider audience, it helps both government and non-government entities do their jobs. New technologies provide many opportunities to make just that happen. We have new capacity to make laws and regulations and compliance assistance readily available across the globe on the internet and via mobile phones. We can provide easy ways to report violations and download information on pollution releases. And we can crowdsource information on corrupt practices. For example, India's online I Paid a Bribe platform that has helped combat corruption. Finally, we must also be aware of the potential negative impacts of changing technology specifically the creation and disposal of discarded electronics. E-waste is a growing problem around the world, but we at EPA are working to change that. And as is often the case, the solutions to this technology and to the challenges it poses can be found in the technology itself. We see the possibility for social media to play a key role in raising awareness and spurring action around this issue. I know the power of that awareness. I've seen firsthand the economic health and environmental consequences of discarded electronics and the burden those e-waste dumps pose to nearby communities. But I've also seen firsthand companies working to safely and profitably recycle electronics, creating jobs and avoiding the growth of a serious pollution threat. There are possibilities to spark new economic activity through safe materials reuse and recovery. Consumers using social media as their platform are already inspiring improved R&D product design. And we can create jobs in economically distressed areas and relieve the health and environmental burdens of discarded electronics in many of those same places. So we are expecting innovation from all sectors of society and in most cases from citizens and communities and our private sector partners. Our challenge is to find creative ways to apply existing technologies and to look back, to look ahead, excuse me, to emerging technologies and assess their potential impacts. As Rio Plus 20, the 20th anniversary of the 1992 Earth Summit approaches in June, we have a chance to learn lessons, build partnerships, and put in place innovative strategies that can reshape the economic and environmental future of our entire planet. It is the rarest of opportunities to truly change the world and make a difference that will benefit billions of people. 
That's the challenge. Now I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you so very much.